Colonel Joshua Chamberlain, commanding 20th Maine. I saw the faces of my men, one after another, when they fired their last cartridge, turn anxiously towards mine for a moment, and square to the front again. To the front for them lay death, to the rear what they would die to save. Not a moment was about to be lost. Five minutes more of such a defensive and the last roll call would sound for us. An excerpt from today's narrative special, Gettysburg, Forces from the Front, Part 1. We'll begin the program right after this break. I'm Robert Child, and this is Point of the Spear. Welcome back. Today's two-part program is another in our series of storytelling specials. First-person accounts are the living link we have to what occurred at Gettysburg, and although some of the accounts may be less than accurate due to the various authors seeing only their narrow view of the conflict and having limited information, they still bring us close to the battle in a deeply personal way. You could call this an immersive type of history, as I've woven the first-hand accounts together so they unfold in a linear way. A Union victory was far from a foregone conclusion at Gettysburg, and these words from two centuries ago bring you closer to that history and those times. Now travel back with me to a divided America in the gravely uncertain days of May 1863. Gettysburg Voices from the Front Written and edited by Robert Child Narrated by Joe Pike and Various Voices it is late May, 1863, and Confederate President Jefferson Davis has called a war council at the White House of the Confederacy in Richmond. In the third week of May, I convened my cabinet, along with my commander of the Army of Northern Virginia, General Lee, to weigh matters of the gravest concern. Numerous letters and telegrams had been received from Governor Peters of Mississippi, which I read aloud to the council. General Grant was threatening our citadel at Vicksburg, and there was much need for reinforcements from our Army of Virginia to be sent to General Johnston's aid. While discussing how we should implement our strategy, matters took a grievous turn for the worse. Word arrived that General Johnston had already withdrawn without a fight, leaving General Pemberton's army to fight Grant alone and Vicksburg virtually unprotected. Something had to be done decisively, but many members expressed that Vicksburg may already be lost and that we should strengthen the defense of Richmond, collect supplies for a six-month siege, and at the proper time dispatch 30,000 of General Lee's troops to Vicksburg. General Lee expressed serious doubt of sending troops from Virginia to the Western Theater. He expressed that, were he required to send a portion of his army west, he would also be compelled to act upon the defense of Virginia. Once his army was pinned up in the Richmond defenses, he believed defeat would be inevitable. He went on to lay out his case for keeping the Army of Northern Virginia intact and using it to take the war into Pennsylvania. In his quiet, earnest way, he described how his men were suffering from dwindling supplies in war-worn Virginia. Moving the war northward would open up new sources of supply for the Army and make the Northern population feel the effects of war. Finally, he urged that the best way to protect Vicksburg was to cut the main supply route to the west at Harrisburg and put Washington, Philadelphia, and Baltimore in danger, and thus cause the withdrawal of Grant's army for their defense. General Lee recommended drawing the Army of the Potomac into the open and winning a decisive victory over them on northern soil, which would hopefully bring peace. George G. Meade, Major General, United States Army. Early on the morning of June 28th, I had received orders that placed me in command of the Army of the Potomac. Meade addresses his men. I assume command of the Army of the Potomac, and as a soldier, I obey this order, although it is totally unexpected and unsolicited. I have no promises, I have no pledges to make. The country looks to you, this army, to relieve it from the devastation and disgrace of a hostile invasion. Whatever fatigues and sacrifices we may be called upon to undergo, let us have in view constantly the magnitude of the interests involved, and let each man determine to do his duty, leaving to an all-controlling providence the decision of the oncoming contest, and I 
rely upon the hearty support of my companions in arms, you, my soldiers, to assist me in the discharge of the important trust which has been confided in me. Gentlemen, I thank you and I ask for your support. General John Buford. General Pleasanton, my extreme left reports a large force coming from Fairfield in a direction to strike the Emmitsburg Road this side of Marsh Creek. Colonel Gamble has just sent word that General Lee himself has signed a pass for a citizen this morning at Chambersburg. The troops that are coming here were the same I found early this morning at Millersburg or Fairfield. General Reynolds has been advised of all I know. I am very respectably your obedient servant, J. N. O. Buford. Marcellus E. Jones, 8th Illinois Cavalry. A little after 7 o'clock, the enemy's advance, composed of Archer's Tennessee Brigade, followed by Davis's and Brockenborough's brigades, appeared in sight on the hill west of Marsh Creek a mile or so away. Upon sighting our picket post, they deployed skirmishers on either side of the road with the precision of veterans marching steadily down the pike to the stone bridge over Marsh Creek. I had sent the horses and a quarter of the men to the rear. The enemy crossing the bridge. Firing began along both lines. Our pickets fell back slowly until the reserve came up when they too dismounted, sending horses to the rear. And here, let me say, if ever men fought with desperation, it was that morning. Lieutenant General James Longstreet. On the morning of the 1st, General Lee and myself left his headquarters together and had ridden three or four miles when we heard the heavy firing along Hill's front. General Lee had left me and hurried forward to see what it meant. In the meantime, General Gamble's brigade had formed on the top of the ridge, McPherson's Ridge, running along the east side of Willoughby Run. Two guns in the 8th Illinois Cavalry on the left of the pike, and two guns balanced to the brigade in the right of the pike, and there awaited the enemy's advance. The firing proceeded from the engagement between our advance and the Federals on Seminary Ridge. General Meade, the enemy forces, A.P. Hills, are advancing on me at this point and driving my pickets and skirmishers very rapidly. There is also a large force at Heidlersburg that is driving my pickets at that point from that direction. General Reynolds is advancing and is within three miles of this point with his leading division. I am positive that the whole of A.P. Hill's force is advancing. J. N. O. Buford About 10 o'clock in the morning, General Anderson, while resting with his division at Cashtown, received a message from General Lee. General Anderson, I cannot think what has happened to Stuart. I ought to have heard from him long before now. He may have met with disaster, but I hope not. In the absence of reports from him, I am in ignorance as to what we have in front of us here. It may be the whole Federal Army, or it may be only a detachment. If it is the whole Federal force, we must fight a battle here. If we do not gain a victory, those defiles and gorges through which we passed this morning will shelter us from disaster. Move your division to Gettysburg at once. General Pleasanton, I'm satisfied that Longstreet and Hill have made a junction. A tremendous battle has been raging since 9.30 a.m. with varying success. At the present moment, the battle is raging on the road to Cashtown and within a short cannon range of this town. The enemy's line is in a semicircle on the height from north to west. General Reynolds was killed early this morning. In my opinion, there seems to be no directing person. We need help now. J. N. O. Buford. General John B. Gordon, Ewell's Corps, Army of Northern Virginia. Riding forward with my rapidly advancing lines, I discovered a brave officer lying on his back with the July sun pouring its rays upon his pale face. He was surrounded by Union dead and his own life seemed to be rapidly ebbing out. Quickly lifting his head, I gave him water from my canteen, asked him his name and the character of his wounds. He was Major General Francis C. Barlow of New York and of Howard's Corps. The ball had entered his body in front and passed out near his spinal cord, paralyzing him in legs and arms. Neither of us had the remotest thought that he could possibly survive many hours. I summoned several soldiers who were looking after the wounded and directed them to place him on a litter and carry him to the shade in the rear. Before parting, 
He asked me to take from his pocket a package of letters and destroy them. They were from his wife. He had but one request to make of me. That request was that if I should live to the end of the war and should meet Mrs. Barlow, I would tell her of our meeting on the field of Gettysburg and of his thoughts of her in his last moments. He wished me to assure her that he died doing his duty at the front, that he was willing to give his life for his country, and that his deepest regret was that he must die without looking upon her face again. I learned later that Mrs. Barlow was with the Union Army and near the battlefield. When it is remembered how closely Mrs. Gordon followed me, it will not be difficult to realize that my sympathies were especially stirred by the announcement that his wife was so near him. I hope you're enjoying part one of Gettysburg, Voices from the Front. Be with us tomorrow for part two and the conclusion of this two-part narrative special. Major General George Edward Pickett, Division Commander, Army of Northern Virginia. My brave boys were full of hope and confident of victory as I led them forth. Over on Cemetery Ridge, the Federals beheld a scene never before witnessed on this continent. A scene which has previously never been enacted and can never take place again. An army! forming in the line of battle in full view under their very eyes, charging across a space nearly a mile in length over fields of waving grain and anon of stubble and then smooth expanse, moving with the steadiness of a dress parade. Oh, the pride, the glory. That's tomorrow on Point of the Spear. Now let's return to the conclusion of Part 1 of Gettysburg, Voices from the Front. Lieutenant General James Longstreet I overtook General Lee at 5 o'clock while General Hill was finishing his report on the day's fight. General Lee and I discussed what to do next. To my surprise, the General thought of attacking Meade upon the heights the next day. I urged him to move the army around the Federal left, get between him and Washington City or Baltimore, and Meade's army would be forced to pursue us an attack. He said, The enemy is there, and I'm going to strike him there. I reminded the commanding general that I had thought we had agreed to a campaign that was offensive in strategy but defensive in tactics. The general replied, No, if the enemy is there tomorrow, I shall strike him there. He was impressed with the idea that by attacking the Federals, he could whip them in detail. W. S. Hancock General Meade, when I arrived here an hour since, I found our troops had given up the front of Gettysburg in the town. We have now taken up position in the cemetery, which cannot well be taken. It is a position, however, easily turned. Slocum is now coming on the ground and is taking a position on the right, which will protect the right, but we have yet no troops on the left, the Third Corps not having yet reported, but I suppose that it is marching up. If so, Sickles' flank march will in a degree protect our left. The battle is quiet now. I think we'll be all right for the night. I think we can retire. If not, we can fight here as the ground appears not unfavorable with good troops. I communicate in a few minutes with General Slocum and transfer command to him. Howard says Doubleday's command gave way. W. S. Hancock. We have won a great victory today. The men have performed bravely in the face of our enemy. The great battle will resume in the morning with the Federals on the heights. Still, I do not know how many troops we face. Is it the entire Federal Army? I should have heard from Stuart. I do not know the ground. It's all in God's hands. Now. Colonel Joshua Chamberlain, commanding 20th Maine. Snatching an hour's sleep by the roadside just before dawn, we reached at about seven o'clock in the morning the heights east of Gettysburg, confronting the ground over which the lost battle of the first day had ebbed. After a little, we were moved to the left across Rock Creek and up the Baltimore Pike to an open field more nearly overlooking the town. 
told to rest a while, we first resumed the homely repast so sharply interrupted the evening before. Next, we stretched ourselves on the ground to make up lost sleep and rest our feet after a twenty-four hours scarcely broken march and get our heads level for the coming test. All the forenoon we had no other intimation as to this than an order given in an impressive tone to hold ourselves ready to take part in an attack on our right, but whether to be begun by us or the enemy we neither knew nor could guess. General Ewell, the main attack will be made by the First Corps on right with Hood's and McClaw's divisions. As soon as you hear Longstreet's guns open, proceed to make a demonstration in our favor to be converted into a real attack if the opportunity offers. Just after three o'clock on the second day in Gettysburg, after several delays during the day already, I received my third request from General Hood for a flanking maneuver around the big round hill. General Longstreet, my scouts report to me that there is a wagon road around Round Top at its foot which has been used by farmers in getting out timber over which I can move my troops. I believe I can take one of my brigades, go around this mountain, and simultaneously attack from the flank or rear with the men in front and capture Round Top. I directed the courier to inform General Hood that General Lee's orders were to attack up the Emmitsburg Road. Due to the lateness of the hour, I then decided to ride myself to General Hood's position to further stress the urgency that he move quickly. Message received by signalman at Meade's headquarters from Little Round Top. A heavy column of the enemy infantry, about 10,000, is moving from opposite our extreme left toward our right. General Warren is here now. About 4 p.m., my battery is open, and soon afterwards, Hood's division on the extreme right moved to the attack. Shortly after hearing the first report of the enemy's artillery, I was handed a note from one of General Meade's couriers requesting reinforcements at the round tops. I directed General Caldwell's division to move forward. However, his Irish brigade was preparing for what might be their final duty. My dear Christian friends, in consideration for the want of time for each one of us to confess his sins in due order as required for the sacrament of penance, I will give you general absolution. But my dear friends, as we stand here and in the presence of eternity, so to speak, with a well-armed force in our front and with missiles of death in the form of shells bursting over our heads, we must humble ourselves before the great creator of all men and acknowledge our unworthiness and conceive a heartfelt sorrow for having ungratefully offended the divine author of all good things. Him who we ought to love we have despised by sinning against his laws. Him who we should honor with lives of virtue we have dishonored by sin. We stand in great debt to our Lord and Master. He loves us, but we, we in our sin have forfeited that love. Therefore, my dear friends, in the solemn presence of eternity, excite in your minds a a deep sorrow for all the sins, negligences, transgressions of your past lives. Rend your hearts and not your garments. And I, the consecrated minister of God, will give you general absolution. Dominos Noster, Jesus Christus vos absolvat. In nomine Patri, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Little Round Top. To the left, at utmost speed, down to the left we pushed the whole Fifth Corps, our brigade nearest and leading, at the double quick, straight for the strife. The fight was desperate already. We passed along its rear, first getting a glimpse of the peach orchard on the right, where our troops were caught between Hill's Corps on Seminary Ridge and Longstreet's Corps, fast arriving on the Emmitsburg Road, and the havoc was terrible. Private John Haley, 17th Maine. As we couldn't check them, we found we must either retire or be surrounded, and we commenced a movement to the rear. 
Nothing seemed to hold them. The battery was pouring shot and everything into them. But on they came. Colonel Jacob Schweitzer, 1st Division, 5th Corps. Finding that we were surrounded, that our enemy was undercover while we were in the open field exposed to their fire, I directed the command to fall back. Just as we started to retire, we met a new line, a portion of the 5th Corps, coming in to relieve us. But the rebels made short work of them. There was now nothing between the rebels and success. So far as I could see, I saw rebels to the right of us and rebels to the left of us, and I know they were coming in the rear of us, thinking the day was lost to us. I was so discouraged that I wept. Colonel Joshua Chamberlain, commanding 20th Maine. The 20th Maine passed on to the wheat field where heroic men, standing bright as golden grain, were ravaged by death's wild reapers from the woods. We had a momentary glimpse of the Third Corps left in the front of Round Top and the fearful struggle at the Devil's Den. Captain Hillier, 9th Georgia Infantry. Our line emerged from the stumpy brush through which we had charged and came out into a long, narrow, but nearly straight opening which skirted the foot of the little round top. On crossing this opening and going a little way up the rocky slope, we saw that not one of the entire line was nearer to the enemy's position than we were and that our little attacking column hesitated. They were all veterans in the highest sense. I heard no order to retreat and gave none. But everybody, officers and men, seemed to realize that we could not carry the position. Captain Hillier, 9th Georgia Infantry. As we neared the summit of the mountain, the shot so raked the crest that we had to keep our men below it to save our heads. Although this did not wholly avert the visits of treetops and splinters of rock and iron. Colonel William Oates, 15th Alabama. About five minutes after my regiment halted, Captain Terrell of Law's staff rode up and told me that General Hood was wounded, that Law was in command and that no troops were on my right, and that Law ordered that I should press forward. The fighting on my left and west of me at this time was very heavy. Reaching the southern face of Little Round Top, I found Vincent there, with intense poise and look. He said with a voice of awe, as if translating the tables of eternal law, I place you here. This is the left of the Union line. You understand? You are to hold this ground at all costs. I did understand, full well, but had more to learn about costs. Colonel William Oates, 15th Alabama. As men fell, their comrades closed the gap, returning the fire most spiritedly. I soon discovered that the left of the 47th Alabama was disconnected, as men were being mowed down like grain before the sand. It was a stirring, not to say appalling, sight. Here, a whole battery of shot and shell cutting a ragged chasm through a serried mass, flinging men and horses like drift aside. There, a rifle volley at close range. With reeling shock, hands tossed in the air, muskets dropped with death's quick relax, others with manhood's proud calm and rally. There, a defiant regiment of ours, broken, slaughtered, captured, or survivors of both sides crouching among the rocks for shelter from the terrible crossfire where there is no rear. Death around, behind, before, and madness everywhere. My dead and wounded were greater in number than those still on duty. I still hoped for reinforcements, but it seemed impossible to retreat. The formidable 15th Alabama, repulsed and as we hoped, dispersed, now in solid, orderly array, still more than twice our numbers came rolling through the fringe of chaparral on our left. No dash, no yells, no demonstration for effect, but settled purpose and determination. I saw the faces of my men, one after another, when they fired their last cartridge, turn anxiously towards mine for a moment and square to the front again. To the front for them lay death, to the rear, what they would die to save. Not a moment was about to be lost. Five minutes more of such a defensive and the last roll call would sound for us. Desperate as the chances were, there was nothing for it but to take the offensive. I stepped to the colors. The men turned towards me. One word was enough. Bayonets! Amidst the confusion, moments later, I did order a retreat. 
I had the officers and men advised that when the signal was given, everyone should run in the direction from whence we came. Ranks were broken, many retired before us, somewhat hastily. Some threw their muskets to the ground, even loaded, sunk to their knees, threw up their hands, calling out, we surrender. We were taking on prisoners by the scores, more than we could hold or send to the rear. So many made final escape up Great Round Top. But it was no light task to get our men to stop. They were under the momentum of their deed. They thought they were on the road to Richmond. They had to be reasoned with, persuaded, but at last faced about and marched back to that dedicated crest with swelling hearts. That's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed part one of Gettysburg, Voices from the Front. Be with us tomorrow for part two and the conclusion of this two-part narrative special. Major General George Edward Pickett, Division Commander, Army of Northern Virginia. My brave boys were full of hope and confident of victory as I led them forth. Over on Cemetery Ridge, the Federals beheld a scene never before witnessed on this continent. A scene which has previously never been enacted and can never take place again. An army forming in the line of battle in full view under their very eyes. Charging across a space nearly a mile in length over fields of waving grain and anon of stubble and then smooth expanse. Moving with the steadiness of a dress parade. Oh, the pride. The glory. That's next time. And if you like what you hear, leave a review or a rating or just click the follow button. And be sure to check out our Point of the Spear YouTube channel with bonus video material plus full military history documentaries. There's tons to explore, and I hope you check it out. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.